Hello, welcome back to RC Video Reviews. Today we've got the build review on the Precision Aerobatics XR52. All right, guys, you know I just completed the Katana, and this XR52 is basically its twin brother. They're slightly different form factor. They have different color schemes, uh, different dimensions in terms of wingspan, and the way the canopy is laid out is a little different. But other than that, these airplanes are twins. I do have a couple of issues to go over. There were no showstoppers, but there were some things you want to know about. Okay, the biggest issue I ran into was that they give you four carbon fiber arms for aileron times two, and then rudder and elevator. And out of the four, the rudder is the longest by, by a stretch. The other three, at least in my kit, were equal in length. I, I measured them, they were all equal within a fraction of a millimeter. So the rudder was obvious because that was definitely the longest run, but the aileron rods worked fine, although there was a little movement in the ailerons. On the, on the Katana, I had to trim all of the carbon fiber rods. On this one, there was some movement, not a lot. So I wasn't concerned that the rod was so short that it would not bite deep enough into the clevis or the ball link. You know, that wasn't a problem. I wasn't worried about that. But on the elevator, I was. On the elevator, it barely fit into the two ends. And I could have resolved it by moving the servo a tooth, but I really didn't want to do that. Fortunately, I had purchased the extra motor mount box, so there was a spare carbon fiber rod in that hardware kit. And when I realized that, I said, oh, I can just steal the rod out of there. And what I wound up doing was I used the rudder on the elevator, and then I used the box, the motor box rod on the rudder. One little problem with that is that the rod for the motor box is slightly bigger in diameter than the one for the rudder. So I had to kind of funnel the ends down on the piece that I used for the rudder. In the end, it all worked out, but had I not had that spare carbon fiber rod from buying the extra motor box, it could have been problematic. <laughs> so it would, have, it would have stopped me. So I'm, I'm kind of a little bummed out about that. I, because I didn't have any problems like that in the, in the build with the, with the Katana at all, nothing. So when you buy these servo extension arms, you have to run the screw for the servo horn through that arm and then through the horn and into the servo. Well, the problem that I had was even though I had to do a little bit of trimming on the top of the servo, there's a ring that goes around the top of the servo arm. You have to trim that off so the servo extension sits flat on that servo arm. Well, even after doing that, the screws that I had for these servos barely, barely, they took like a thread, maybe one thread, that was it. And that was with the horn pressed all the way down. Okay, so I don't blame the airplane for that. That's not the airplane's fault. That's an issue with the manufacturer of the servo because they use these screws that only, I mean, I, I don't know how thick that servo arm is. Well, why don't we find out? <laughs> I got a ruler right here. So that servo extension is 1.4 millimeters. And because we added 1.4 millimeters to the thickness of the screw, the damn screw for the servo horn didn't work. And, and that's, you know, I don't know what it is with the hobby. That's one of the things that just bothers me. Kind of like the control arm. Why, why was that control arm so close? It shouldn't have been that close. On the Katana, all of them were long enough that I had to clip them. This one was so close that it was concerning enough for me to not use it. So I ended up having to figure out another solution. And the same thing with these servo arm screws. I don't, I don't really get it. Fortunately, I had this little kit. I think I got it on Amazon. It's a, uh, it's a CO road kit. I don't know what, you, I don't even know what that means. I, I just, I think I got it on Amazon, but I have all these different screw sizes inside. And thankfully I couldn't believe it. The two, the uh, M2 by six, that one fit. And it gave me plenty of bite inside the servo horn. I couldn't believe I was that lucky that I had these. So this is, you know, if, if you don't have something like this in your, in your stash, good idea, go, go hunt for it and get something because I'm telling you, man, without this, I would have been dead in the water because I really would not have wanted to fly this plane if I had screws that held the servo horns on with just one thread. That, that wouldn't have made me happy at all.
those were the two main issues that I had on the build. Everything else went together just fine. Uh, the ailerons obviously were already hinged. The vortex generators, I'll give you a little tip on this. It's in the book, but I'm gonna tell you out loud. Because the bottom of the wing uses a transparent film, what they have you do is take a pin, locate where the vortex generators go on the bottom, and just stick a pin all the way through the wing so you pierce the, the covering on the top side, which is really clever because then you have, and there are notches in there. It's kind of, I'm not, I don't think I can get you to see these, but you, when you look at it from the side, you can see the notches for the top side right through there. So you stick your pin through, it pierces the covering on the top side, and that locates where the vortex generators go on the top. So very clever. I can only imagine that if you don't follow their instructions on that one, that you're gonna wind up having a lot of unnecessary holes in your shrink covering. So that was definitely a really cool technique for getting these vortex generators placed correctly. I mentioned in the Katana video that there's very little room for getting these screws correctly placed on the cowl. So you don't have any room to, to mess around on this XR52 either. Same, same issue that you had on the Katana. It's a very small tab and you have to hit it right. There are, there are many good videos out there on how to install a cowl using the tape method. I thought about making a video, but honestly, there's enough good ones out there that it would be kind of pointless, I think, for me to try it. So go search and learn how to install a cowl via the tape method because without that, you're not going to get it right. You're just flat not going to get it right. Okay, continuing on with the front of the motor, I told you that I would show you the second motor box. This is the V2 motor box. And the idea behind this one is that it no longer, the, the, the original V1 comes out to about here and there's a firewall up front and the motor mounts on, on the front. It's a front mount motor. This is the V2 box that's got some blind nuts back there and a firewall and it uses a traditional radial mount or cross mount to go on the front and you screw that on and it's a typical motor mount. Well, here's the problem. Remember, this is an Emacs GT2826 motor in this airplane and here is the radial mount that goes with it. Check out the size discrepancy between the radial mount for this class of motor and what they give you on the firewall. Now, I can't understand what, what the deal is here unless they're just trying to find, I really don't know. I don't have an answer. I, this is one of those things that makes me crazy because you, I, I really prefer it when vendors use standard industry standard sizes because that gives the consumer the option and what they're doing here is they're forcing you into using your motor mount and i also went through my stash looking for other motor mounts that would fit and the cross pattern for the motor is right here it's it's these these screw holes that one that one that one and that one so that standard for the motor and i had plenty of other motor mounts that would work with that motor but all of them, the, the hard mounts for the firewall were way too big. So I think PA sells a radial adapter and carbon fiber, I think. So if you're interested in using your own motor, you might have to go that route. But I can tell you right now that fitting a standard one on the V2, this is a, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I wanna be cautious about what I say here, but I don't like it. I'll put it that way, I don't like it. Um, I, I prefer for these to be standard size. And, and so industry standard, if for this class of motor, that, that radial mount should fit on that firewall. And it's not even close. I mean, it'd be pretty major surgery to correct that. I mean, significant surgery to correct that. It's, it's just not even close. Just like on the Katana, there is a motor box addendum floating around out there where you have to add these carbon fiber straps to the side and then you do a little bit of fiberglass work inside and then fiberglass across the top with epoxy to reinforce this motor box. And I, I, I have a feeling it's because they've, they've come apart. In the end, I was able to get my Emacs GT2826 to mount fine on the V1 motor box. So if you wanna go with an, a non-thrust motor solution for this plane, you can order these planes with the V1 box. Regarding the prop, that is just a test prop that I use for balancing purposes. I have an XOR 13 by 6.5 on the way. This will be running with a four cell pack. If you remember, I did the motor test on this Emacs motor and I 
decided with the 14.7 that I could probably back it down just a little bit. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go down to a 13.65 and um, that'll be the motor that I run. There's the same active cooling in this design that we saw on the Katana where they use those plastic scoops. I think that's a very cool feature because you can see that air goes right into that motor. It's, a, it's an air scoop and they capture the air and send it into the motor. It feeds over the ESC and then of course it egresses out of the back of the plane. Okay, one last little tip that I'd have. When you install the servos, keep in mind that they use carbon fiber to great effect on these planes. So the servo mounting plates have carbon fiber reinforcements. So when you use your drill, you're not gonna wanna use a pin vise. You're actually you're gonna wanna use an actual drill and they need to be sharp because if they're not sharp, you're gonna be drilling for quite a while. I had one bit that I think went dull from drilling all the carbon fiber on this thing and by the time I got to the end, man, it just wasn't doing the job. So I, I had to switch to a different bit. But just keep that in mind because you are drilling carbon fiber. You are going to probably go through a bit or two <laughs> when, you're, when you're poking holes through the mounting surfaces for the plane. All right, let's just talk real quick about fit and finish and we'll wrap this thing up. As you'd expect with a precision aerobatics plane, if you look at the fit and finish along the side, it's very tight, very, very tight. I, I don't see any air. I do see a little bit of light coming through right here, very small, but I might be able to work on that a little bit. I'm not gonna fault the plane for that. I might be able to tighten the wings just a little bit. The cowl and the canopy fit perfectly together. There's a very nice mesh point and the, the, the cowl, you just, I don't see airplanes out there very often that have this nice of a fit between the cowl and the canopy and it's perfect although some of you will point out that the the cowl is a shade off from the canopy and that's true there's no arguing that it's definitely off a little bit I don't know if that's by design or if they had a color match issue but it is definitely off a little bit it's definitely two different shades so I, I want to point that out just so you know before you buy this plane what you're getting the landing gear the landing gear is a work of art I mean I've Again, I put a lot of planes together and I've just never seen a plane that has landing gear that goes together as precise and as clean with one exception and that you guys know that what that is, that's the Vanquish. But otherwise, this landing gear is just perfect. It's very light, it's very sturdy. Uh, the wheels are perfect, the wheel pants are perfect. And you normally, I, I see problems with these. They're just, they're a pain in the neck a lot of times. And then if you look at the bottom, you can see that the cowl lines up graphics wise, very clean with the paint job on the side of the plane. I do have a couple of extra decals I need to apply uh, that'll carry the theme from here onto the cowl. I haven't put those on yet, but I will. I did put them on up here so you can see how they carry the decals forward uh, from the body onto the cowl up here. And then of course the 52, that's a pretty cool looking logo up there. I like that. Um, you do have to cut the ventilation out of the back and I don't know let's see if I can get this okay you do have to cut the ventilation out of the back don't forget that because if you don't this is where people probably were blowing their canopies off so you make sure you open that up and then leave yourself a little material so you can iron it down and make it nice and clean looking back there the tail wheel assembly is real simple you just cut a hole stick it in epoxy it's a piece of cake and then the same what I consider to be top shelf control rod arrangement, carbon fiber horns, metal clevises, carbon fiber rods, a ball link, and a carbon fiber extension. I mean, it just, you have to be precise putting it together, and I'll maintain what I said on the Katana, that do not use a servo centering tool to center these servos. Get your radio paired up with your receiver, get the receiver connected, and center your servos based on what the receiver says, not a servo centering tool. You will regret it if you don't. But if you do use your, your, use your radio to center your servos, you should wind up with a very, very precise install. And I did. Mine, when I turn this, when I turn this system on, everything pretty much goes to dead even. I think on one of these ailerons, I had to put 1% of offset in, and that was it. <laughs> so. You just have to take your time, use some tape, and make sure you have your, your control surfaces centered before you glue everything up and while you're measuring, and uh, just take your time. You, you, this, is not a, this is not a toy plane. You, you have to spend the time on this one to get it right. But you'll be rewarded with a very well-flying airplane if you do. Okay, center of gravity. 
the book recommends a range between 107 and 110. They say at 109.5 millimeters <laughs> that they found the optional configuration when you, use, when you use the optional vortex generator. So I have the vortex generators and I set mine at 109. So I'm exactly at 109. And um, they say you can move it forward a little bit if you want to have more of an iMac or sport flying style or windy weather. And, um, but you can only, they recommend only moving it forward to 107.5. And then in order to get that balance point, I'll be using a 2650 Nanotech 4 cell. And that battery is crammed all the way up front in order to get the balance. So I have, and I think the reason for that is because the Emax motor is lighter than the thrust equivalent. So I've got my, so I've got the ESC as far forward as I can stuff it in this cowl. And then you can see right there, I've got the battery. That is the 2650 four cell. And I've got it as far forward in that compartment as it'll go. And it balances correctly at that point. I put my receiver right there. That's the receiver. So I do balance at the 109. I don't think it's 109.5, it's 109, but uh, I think that'll be okay to get us started. And then as far as the throws go, I set this one up exactly the way the book calls it for highs and lows. And then in the middle, I gave myself rates that were a little bit more on par with where I set up the Katana for its lows. So I'm gonna use the book setup for low and high and then I'll put what I think should work in the mid rates. Yep, and that's that on rates. All right, guys, that's all I've got on the build review for the PA XR52. I hope you liked the material. If you did, your subscription would be appreciated. And for those of you who are already subscribers, please continue to comment and leave thumbs up or thumbs down and tell me what you think about this build review and stay tuned for the maiden. I've got to get the prop and the prop spinner, the correct prop spinner, and our field is closed for a couple of days for maintenance. So I won't be able to do a maiden for a couple of days, but I will be able to get started on that Hobby King MX2. So that'll probably be the next thing up. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed the content. That's all I've got for tonight. Take it easy. Other than that, these, these airplanes are twin. Are I do have a couple things I want to go through with you that might save you some time. I do have a couple things I like to cover though, because it wasn't all. I do have a couple things we need to cover because it wasn't flawless. There were a couple things. There were, I do have a couple of items to cover. I do have a couple of issues we need to talk through though. So I want to give you, there were a couple of issues on this build. Nothing. Oh man, this is just terrible. What a terrible start. I do have a couple of issues to talk over with you. Nothing that was, I do have a couple of issues to go. <laughs> but when you screw these on, you have to run. <laughs> Always something, man. Always something.